Well, I appreciate you coming on, dude. It's I've seen your a lot of your content. Um, you've been on like the Tankers page since, dude, like it first started in like 2012 or something. I've seen like various comments and stuff. You did. I I never I I because of your title I I caught you early on in your career so I was just always kind of off and on just kind of sticking around and I uh, I was actually there was a, a Instagram is not really my my big profile I actually used to just follow it because I, I there were a certain couple of women that I that I followed who were really really pretty and then of course. Uh, let's just say things went sour there. So I ended up, uh, I I've backed off. I tried using it for like connection for like whisper and for glorious enemy, but it just never went through. So and mostly I just follow it for your content, Sean Ryan and some of the other guys. And occasionally a pretty girl crops up and I just kind of look at him and go, that's pretty. And then I just keep on scrolling. Oh yeah. I mean, you got to appreciate beauty wherever it is. Um, yeah, when you're single like me, it happens. Well, I'm married. I got three kids. Uh, I just have to. Lucky son of a gun. Lucky son of a gun. It's a good life, man. I wouldn't trade it. Um, ah, amen to that. So l let's uh, let's talk. You, when did you join the army? I joined the army in uh, August 20th, 2003. Was my BASD, Basic Active Service Date. Okay, so August of 2003, that was like right after a rat kicked off. Yes, and it kind of killed me a little bit that I wasn't there because my cousin was actually there with the 101st Airborne as a combat engineer. He actually got to see. he. There's stuff that he says he, he will not tell me about, but I know that he saw quite a bit more than I did. Absolutely, yeah. Some of the guys when I was coming up in 3rd uh, ID were, uh, they were heavily involved in, in um the initial push basically our our company uh dealer company 269 armor it was uh oh you were 269 yeah oh, that was, explains a lot i was 269 i was out of benning actually they couldn't uh third id had to move us out to fort benning to keep us away from the the rest of third id for whatever reason um yeah because you can't shoot a oh, week shoot. Too flat. it's Benning, when they built the DMPRC, that's actually kind of a challenging range. I've seen a lot of tankers suck on that range. Like Hastings is a decent range, um, really. But the DMPRC, dude. Uh, I mean, just see it for the Sullivan Cup. See the some of the challenges that the crews were having out there. It's it's a tough range. Um, it's no rod range. I mean, uh, so. You joined the Army 2003, went through one station unit training at, at Knox, I'm assuming. Yes, sir. I, I went through Knox as well. Um, yeah, that the was... The last a, of the dying breed. Mm-hmm. That was a, a wild... That was a wild wake-up, you know, being from somewhere where there's no humidity and jumping into the summer in uh, Fort Knox. I was like, what is this? Yeah, I, I will. I'm, I'm the northern neighbor to Kentucky. I'm up in Indiana. So it's... It's not so... It's not so... It, the, the weather itself doesn't surprise me, but uh, that winter in particular uh, really hit hard. That was a harder winter. And I was actually, when I showed up in August, it was already starting to set in. By, by late October, it was already starting to drop significantly. And we actually graduated just about mid-December of that year. We were in early class because of... Uh, the war effort that was going on they were trying to get everybody churned out as quickly as possible with of course those the exceptions of those who failed whether it was the red phase but black phase gold phase didn't matter if they if they failed out they were like nope get to the next class go on and i did not want to have to put that damn red tape back on my freaking on my earplug case i no way in hell mm -mm, nope nope so i i there came a moment in the middle of my uh, OSUT where I was I was really depressed and I was really homesick. And uh, I'll never forget my guy Dillinger. He actually was one of the uh, squad leaders. He actually stepped in and just was like, Pharaoh, you've already been here, you know, over 10 weeks. We've literally got less than six weeks of this. You can do this. And that that kind of got me over the hump a little bit. Still had a few stumbles, but uh, never forget that freaking uh, that final 25 kilometer march they had because they wanted to half and half us and get us ready because they said 
there are odds you might end up being infantry. And I was just like, Shit. wait, huh? <laughs> and they, so yeah, they went ahead with us uh, instead of making it the final march was not a 13 K ruck march. It was a 25 K ruck march. Uh. Whew. That was a, that was an exciting moment for me. <laughs> That's a, uh... Yeah, all right. Let's keep going, boys. And uh, luckily, you didn't go to two nine. You know, you were in two seven two. We did the Manchu Mile in Korea. I'm just saying. Oh, see, I when I got to Korea, I actually, uh, I, I was right across from one nine Manchus and the other guys, and they talked about the Manchu Mile, but uh, the very first time that they were saying we were doing a road march, I'm like, okay, let me get my ruck, and they said. What are you talking about? I'm like, we're doing a road march, right? And they said, road march. That means you're not rucking anywhere. It means you're getting on the tank. And I just went, oh, that's sweet. So much better. Yep, I, I got the, the damn. Right I got the Manchu Mile coin. I walked the Manchu Mile. I did two of those sons of bitches. That's those. That are, that's some, that's some hard humping. That is hard humping, dude. Especially up that freaking god that staircase to hell. Jesus. So the, I'm taking it that Korea was your first duty station. Mine too. Yeah. Uh, my whole platoon from uh, tank school went straight to Korea. It was like we all went to either two nine uh, to Demon Company or to Crazy Horse Company in two nine, and uh, it was just like the most. Oh, like all everybody in Demon Company was like, "Who the hell are all these brand new pro?" Like they they got the whole like basic training company just came here. Hi, <laughs> um, dude, that was... had to be exciting. That had to be exciting. Suddenly, all of you from from the same company, just still in the same area. You all didn't you know, how you didn't worry about the drinky girls, now, did you? I'm not really a drinky girl guy. Um, mm, good, good. Because so... I remember the times that I actually did get off base, and that they some of them were sweet, and then there were those who were mm -hmm, questionable. Most of my boys and I went down into Seoul because, like, we're we're tourists, man. We would like randomly get, go down on the train. It's like a two-hour drive down to Seoul, and then we would get off on random stops. Like, hey, this is Gong Dak Bong. Let's go here <laughs> and just start drinking soju and hanging out and seeing all the sights. And dude, there's like castles that you can walk through. And Seoul, Seoul is an awesome city. It's 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 an incredible i it's a very different i mean for me as a country boy it's a very different sensation to actually walk into a city with so much so many people around and so much and plus i'm sorry the the koreans they just have so much tech it's oh, yeah. and it's such a, it's, it's such a stark difference like you go from the back the back areas where you know and we call them the book the backwoods where we're from but mm -hmm. i mean literally their country is like you'll see a little three three cylinder beater of a, of a truck just sitting on the side of the road and then you get into the city and it's just supercars and freaking buses sitting next to each other and you're just like what the f where, where where was this when i was there uh, i'm literally and then 30 minutes outside you're just you're just oh there's a dog farm huh <laughs> yeah what was that kegogi yeah kegogi kegogi yes don't eat the ke eat begogi bagogi bagogi is beef that was the that was the one you was if they said kegogi i was like mm -mm. no thank you sir no oh, yeah, no, no i don't want that dude the korean food slapped it was so good just going down to random spots and eating like ugh. and their seafood the seafood that they sell is insane is just insane they do so well. I'm like, although I'm sorry, I could never get with their kimchi. All the all the Korean guys that that were embedded with us, I swear, every single one of them wanted to get that kimchi, and I'm just like, it's rotten cabbage, guys. Why? But <laughs> all the katusas. Yes. So for I anybody who doesn't that. know, sorry, the katusa in every army company that's in Korea, at least in the armor company, I can only speak for the armor and I believe the infantry companies. We have Koreans augmented to the United States Army or Katusas that are Republic of Korea Army soldiers who are conscript. They have to do their mandatory two year service. And so they get some of these guys get task org to be embedded within a U.S. Army company. And so these guys live with you. They go to the field with you. They're on their you're they're on your tanks. Um, they, they're, fight, they're, they fight. They fight the fight. 
we fight they together. Fight fight. And Absolutely. They, they, uh, it's and it's I cannot say. I mean, even with even with the the regular rock army, the Red Republic of Korea. You know, some of these some of these people they talk so badly about other nations. You know, they make us look bad. I'm sorry. Those guys could speak English as well as anybody else. I mean, I remember yeah. once. I remember one sergeant major from the Rock Army showing up, and dude couldn't have been more than five five, but the way he carried himself, you just knew this man's a killer, and he was our instructor for for some of the CQC techniques that we were supposed to be doing, and he was just like, "So, bring up one of your best," and every single one of us just looked at one another like oh fuck no i ain't doing it you do it I, <laughs> some of the guys looked at me and i was like don't even think about it i'm a 135 pound stick that man is gonna break me <laughs> get you get freaking they had to get wagner and that sergeant major put him out i mean just laid him out i mean you you blink and it's done and you just we all just went okay yeah they're not to be fucked with, and the Katusas are the same exact type of guys. They're they just Taekwon too. Like they're professional. Like they are so. I mean, and every single. I mean, the, we were. I was still around with the black boots. Every single Katusa spit shined to mirror finish. I'm just going. How the hell y'all do that? You're doing this better than me. That look. They're making me look bad. Damn it. Hey. <laughs> well, if not, I mean, Rockstar Major will come over and he'll freaking. Well, give them a roundhouse or something i never i never did hear though if the katusas were they were they were subordinate they they worked with us they followed our orders but they but if the republic of korea basically re recalled them they had to follow that order so I'm they, they were entirely really sure. kind of in a middle they were really in a kind of a middle spot Mm -hmm. where it came to like if something if an emergency cropped up they were expected to follow the rocks uh orders unless it was an unlawful order which i don't course, know i wouldn't want to break up a, a qualified tank crew that's just one yeah. thing you know i i i believe that having the rocks arm major embedded within the unit would be one of those things like hey he's going to go with us he's going to be in charge of the katusas their task order to you guys so if you have any problems let rocks arm major know and he'll he'll handle that ass um yep. And yeah, I, I don't want to break up a qualified crew who knows what they're doing. You've got a qualified gunner. You've got a loader who already knows how to stack things, how to get everything going. Um, our Katusas couldn't drive and they couldn't be TCs. They could. Let me think. I think, no, you're right. We did not have any drivers. Uh, we had, we had three loaders and a, uh, and a gunner. We had three loaders and a gun. Well, that was up until the time that we actually got tagged and we were supposed to go to Ramadi. Then it changed. Um, but uh, there was also, oh God, what am I thinking about? I'm thinking about that. Uh, well, the K1 for one, the K1 came up. And it, a lot of people don't understand that when you go to Korea and you get your standing orders, you understand the gravitas of what you're doing. Because we're not expected to survive. No, Casey's a speed bump. Yeah, and that's what a lot of people are like. They're they're, they're like, well, we got thirty thousand troops there, and I'm like, yeah, and there's a half million on the other side with six million tons of munitions they can drop on your head in less than seven days. So what's that tell you? And everybody's like, well, they're just all old ammunition, and I'm like, that don't matter. Half that ammo is going to go off. That's still three and a half million tons of ammo, boy. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things that Casey, Camp Casey, when it, when it was the primary armor base, I believe everybody's down to Humphreys now, but yeah. you were just within artillery range. So if you're downrange, hanging out, drinking with the boys and stuff, and they start that attack and they start hitting all those different pre-plots with, uh, with artillery, you're going to get to the motor pool and you're going to have very little to work with your tank. Like oh. a lot of the base is going to be destroyed. Like you may survive, but you're not going to have much to fight back with. But I mean, let, now let's talk about our, rock army I capability. Think yeah. I think, I our, our, fight I the think rock. our, but I think our, re, re, uh, I think our, we're our best time to, to drill when we would go down and, and get the call up was about, I want to say uh, less than an hour within less than an hour. We would have everything all set up 
engines running ready to roll. So, I mean, if they actually hit us with a pre-plot and our counter battery couldn't have taken, I think our counter battery could have taken them. I think it could have. Um, but yeah, it would have been it would have been a hell to to try and get through. And that was when I learned that my my battalion was the only one that was going to be dispatched south towards Seoul. The rest of you guys would have to get stuck up on on the bridges and hold until relieved. And I was just like, eh, yeah. wait, that's that that there's no relief. That's the point. <laughs> okay, but yeah, the K one we didn't get to see. Everybody's been asking me about the K two Black Panther mm -hmm. and. I literally can't say anything much about it other than what I read because I didn't see it in action. I saw the K1, and every single time I saw it, I just went, baby, I'm one. It's oh, so yeah. cute. The K2 it's is awesome. sick. It's got that L55 on it. Um, it's yeah. it's a sick tank, dude. I, I want to go over there, and I want to see one shoot. I, I ideally want to shoot one, but that thing is sick. I want to see that damn thing, and I want to see how, whether or not that how that targeting system works because they say it's an active it's an active tracking system. If yeah, so you just put a big box on it like an Apache, and it just tracks auto target track. I think the T seventy two B three has that or something. Yeah, yeah, the T ninety M, the the T ninety M fourth generation, the T eighty B V M fourth generation, and the uh, fuck, I want to say the Leclerc, the most recent Leclerc also has that that type of sight, but I can, but don't quote me on it. It's useful. It is compared to on I mean, down... world TIS guys on the M1A1, where you're just like Gunner Sabo tank. It's more of a question. <laughs> it, 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 it's a boxy shape. I can't tell. It's a green blob. Shoot it. <laughs> exactly. Let me let me clarify by looking through the gas real quick. And yeah, that's a, that's a tank target. <laughs> exactly. It, and only and a lot of people forget that. But then again, we didn't have it as bad as the uh, the guys in Desert Storm. They had it horrible. They, from what I hear, their their sights were so bad it was just like they couldn't even. And they also didn't have um, they didn't the, like dust would actually still interfere with the TIS back then, like severely interfered. And I'm just like, really? They're like, yeah, oh yeah, we couldn't see shit. I'm like, but so to their credit, they killed a lot of shit. <laughs> And I think that that speaks more to the to the training and also the, everybody wants to talk strategy. Everybody wants to talk like the. Did you hear about this dude uh, McDonald or what's his face, um, the general who's been talking about Ukraine recently? I've heard so many talking heads. I it all blends together, but I don't. He doesn't stand out. <laughs> yeah, well, he he his claim to fame is that he was the strategic operations officer of the S2 for the Battle of 73 Easting. And he was like, well, I was basically the one who ran the entire operation. And I'm like, you're not McMasters. You're uh, you're not you're you're not the guy who was actually in the seat. OK, you were in the rear with the gear there, but you might want to reconsider but every single every single time that I see this man brought up, he's always talking about, well, Russia's winning, Russia's winning, Russia's going to win. And I'm just like, you've been wrong consistently for over a year. I think you need to sit down and take whatever meds you need to to re renegotiate your brain right now, Boyle. It's just sad at this point. I got you. It's uh, yeah, they're surrounded in Bakhmut right now. The Ukrainians are. We'll see if they break through. We'll see what happens. I I don't know. I don't bring it where it comes to, and I did not bring this up on TikTok, and I, but I'll share it with you and your viewers, wh whoever sees this. I already called it less than three months ago. Every single fighter in Bakhmut knew they were dead. They knew that it's not a Stalingrad moment. That's, this is a moment where they're base. It's an Alamo moment. They're, you're going to remember them because they're not going to. Unless unless they expend every single one of those Russians, which they won't, which they won't. Those men and women already know that they're they're gone. So they're they're going to pay with every they're going to give every meter is going to be paid in Russian blood. That's it. There's there's no there's no other way. It's a and sobering I thought. Yeah, I know. And everybody hates me for that because, you know, they're like, oh, you're pro-Russia. No, I'm not pro-Russia. I'm pro-realist. I could already see the writing on the wall when I looked at it. 
this is how the Russians operate. They grind you into the dust. So if you want to grind them into the dust, you have to be willing to put your men in that lineup and say flat out, put them down hard. Don't don't give them an inch. Don't give them a meter without taking one. And to their credit, they have. I mean, for over, what, four months, five months now they've been doing this? And for the last two months, they've been claiming, you know, Bakhmut is falling, Bakhmut is falling. Now it may finally fall. And yes, they'll get their little, oh, woohoo, we have this. And I'm just going to look at them and go, great, you just destroyed a city of 70,000 people for what? One madman? What good is that? Makes no damn sense to me. The it whole doesn't. thing doesn't make any damn sense to me. Like Russia was in a position prior to this. Their their video game industry. I know it sounds ridiculous to talk about, but the video the Russian video game industry was on the on the rise. Russia was becoming slightly more accepted in in different circles, and um, but there was still a lot of animosity worldwide towards Russia, especially for some of the things that have transpired over the last thirty years, and um, I think this just. It's unfortunate. It's completely it undermines, unnecessary. It undermines everything that they were working for. And the problem that – and this is the thing. is like I understand Alexander Dugan. I understand his concept of a Russian federation that is basically rewriting back to the Soviet Union. But it's BS. So how in the hell Putin even came up with this idea? And you remember in 2008 when, when they went into Crimea. And, and in Georgia. Georgia as well, yeah. I was, I was expecting to go in there. Yeah. I was staring at those pictures of those T eighty Bs and I was just kind of going, President, are we going? Because if we're going, you need to let me know. Yeah, I was nervous being in Korea. I was like, dude, we're close. Like they could very well all right, boys. I was in Iraq. I was in Iraq and I was like, it is only one of, it is a hop, skip, and a jump away. It's through Turkey on up. That's all it takes. I was oh, like, man. we going? So let's talk about Iraq. So you were like one of the only units to deploy from Korea to Iraq. I don't know if there are any other units that did that. I mean, I'm talking big armor units. Two nine sure as hell didn't go. Um, first tank didn't go. And then first, second tank. Um, yeah, you guys, when did you go? Where did you go? Talk to me about some of your, your tour, what you were doing. Uh, what did you take with you? Did you tank it? Just walk me through it from like the time you got your orders all the way until the time you got in a country and where you went. Did you from take your own tanks? That, yes, we took our own tanks. Uh, but we had the original M1A1 HCs, the heavy commons that mm -hmm. they still had there for the last like 20 years. Um, and those things were, I mean, they were rusty old beasts, but they were beasts all the same. Um, but then we, uh, we got the new. This was back before the A2 set B2, so they were still on a set B1. Uh, that was the end, but we were still on M1A1 Ames, and they were trying to bring all A1s up to A2 standard in certain areas, and that was what the M1A1 Ames was. So we got a shipment of M1A1 Ames, but we got them probably, I want to say about a month and a half or two months after we had gotten our orders like i it was i was i got to uh korea in january of 2004 after i graduated and i had my two week leave with my family uh and four months in uh you know i was you know by then i realized it was the cold war and it wasn't going to go anywhere hot we weren't going to go invade in north korea so i was just like well i get to sit here for a year but four months in, we suddenly get a, I get a call from one of the guys, and he's like, oh, hey, do you know we're going to Iraq? And I just went, what? And he's like, yeah, we're, we're getting tagged. I was like, yeah, by the way, you got your cell phone on you? I had to call my mom. She freaked out. But uh, after that, it was immediate uh, reversal of everything. We, we had been expecting to go to gunnery in three months. Mm -hmm. That got pushed up. I, I, everything got shifted around. Second BCT got pulled up, and suddenly we were pulling two different field uh, problems at the just basically back to back. And mm -hmm. they were just like, get them, get them trained up, get them trained up, get them trained up, get them ready for the hot weather. I mean, it, everything had. To, and Colonel Abrams basically had to make us available immediately for what was 
going from this, you know, the mountains of Korea with freezing cold winters and, and, you know, monsoony summers. And now he had to train us up for desert heat. And it was a testament to, uh, to the training that when we got to Kuwait, not a single Korean, uh, unit had a heat casualty. Everybody else who went through Kuwait had a heat casualty, at least at minimum three or four heat casualties from people not ingesting enough water. Not a single Korean, uh, Korean transplant suffered, suffered the same. And you guys so didn't have to get an NTC, did you? No, no, we, yeah, all our gunnery was, uh, was on the peninsula. So, uh, we went from, so in four months it was, you know, we got that, we got that, uh, we got that call and two more field problems, gunnery, and we got our M1A1 aims. And then they said, okay, congratulations, check them out, make sure they're good. Yeah, they're good. Okay. Congratulations. Now put them back on the tank now put, put them back on the train. So they took our M1A1 aims away and sent them over to the dockyards out at the port to ship them off. So we only got like a few days on them to actually see them before we had to send them away. And then it was, it was August 20th, 2004. I remember that date because it was a year from my act for my BASD and August 18th, I got on the plane August 20th, 2004, I was boots down on Kuwait. And I remember the door opening up and just that furnace hitting my face. And I just went, Oh shit. Okay. Here we are. It's hot. Oh, it was boiling. It was boiling hot. The very first thing that we did as soon as we stepped off there at the end of the tarmac was, was like three, three pallets of water. And everybody just went straight over and just started passing them out, just going, drink, drink, we're here, it's it's on. Absolutely, so, yeah. dude. Did you, uh, <laughs> so what was your guys' mission when you got to Ramadi? Were you like out of FOB Ramadi, or where were you guys? Yeah, we were out of FOB Ramadi. Uh, we took a four-day trek up there. It was, uh, we spent like two weeks, two and a half weeks in Kuwait, getting familiarized, getting acclimated to the heat. Uh, then dispatched north, and they put us on the back of the hets, and mm-hmm. the head drivers got us to, but we had to stay in the tanks, and they and we were just like, so what okay. happens if we take fire? And they said, drive right off the fucker, and we were like, okay, that's easy enough. So our 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 answer to contact was get the hell off the head and engage whatever you can. Uh, we didn't take any damage or any uh, incoming. On the way there, we stopped off at Anaconda, Mortaritaville, uh, for about a day. And then when we finally arrived at Fab Ramadi, I remember uh, getting out of my tank and jumping off and literally sinking up to my ankles in moon dust. And I just went, fuck. <laughs> yep. And I just, mm, yeah. Yeah. The only guys who have been there would know moon dust, and that stuff is just everywhere, everywhere. It's like it to to describe it for the viewers, you have to think of in terms of like like the softest possible sand. It it could it, it, people probably pay for this shit in their scrubs, you know? They they probably pay for oh. Hi, <laughs> Mrs. Sorry, probably to, sorry to Mrs. Tankers. I'm sorry. That's all good. I'm, I'm reminiscing now. Um, yeah, it's it's like people pay for this stuff in spas to have this soft uh, this soft of sand around them, and I'm just like I'm standing up to my ankles in it, going, oh, "This is gonna be fun, ain't it?" And by that point, they basically, and that's when we started mission, and it was it was nonstop. It was ops on msr mobile it was outer cordons for raids it was inner cordons for raids it was and uh our uh, q our qrf was a terminator and that was a 24-hour sit and there's at least two guys on the radios in the tanks um and usually it was like by that point they they figured out we want to make sure that we have our tanks spread out properly So it was usually instead of sending all four tanks, what they do is they'd send um, 
they'd send two tanks and two brats. Gotcha. And then they, and if they had uh, if they had the if they had an extra Humvee, they'd throw one in there. So that um, way you could have dismounts and kick them out or scoop other scoop dudes up if they need to get Kaza back or whatever. Yep, yep. And that happened in more than once. I'll never forget first Sergeant Vergamini. He was my top. And I swear to God, that man, every every time we heard of about a hit, if there was news of one of our guys or somebody else getting injured, Vergamini was the first first man in that soft skin one one three. I mean, he was just and he was a big husky fellow, you know. He never he never made tape, so he couldn't make Sergeant Major. Uh, but he he was the first one just out that door, bashing it down, getting out to that one one three, and going, "Let's roll." And sure enough, he'd go get the boys and he'd bring them home. And that's up, man, I love leadership out. like that. Just people yeah. that you know are willing to mix it up. And one thing oh, yeah. about tankers is we may not always be the thinnest folk, but if you have to break track if you have to like replace track in the motor pool you want some dude with some ass on of it um oh, yeah. there, there are plenty of my boys that ass plenty of my boys that i had no ass i'm the i'm the i'm the opposite i'm the idea i'm the ideal tanker because i'm tiny <laughs> yeah i was i was always a skinny little bastard but yeah there there's some big old dudes and whenever we get like a dude who's like under like five eight i'd say everybody be scrapping like that's my loader <laughs> like because like that's the perfect right. size to like get in there and like up oh! <laughs> you know but anybody in, in anybody in the five six to five nine region and if they're pushing about a buck 80 if they got if they got that corn fed you mm -hmm. know working man strength instantaneous that's your loader congratulations go away for it and you're just like fuck but those boys sling rounds like nobody's business, and I love it. They're just like you see them. I mean, they tried getting me. I could, I barely qualified. I could get like a Sabo in five, and it for a heat. I was lucky to get seven. It was just, it was just, it was just so abnormal for my scrawny arms to actually have to get this round loaded. And by that point, they basically looked at me and said, "You know, Pharaoh, you're actually a really Good decent thing. driver." Thank you. They said, "We're going to stick to you in there." I don't even know her name, and I she's in, I'm Kelly. so sorry, Miss Kelly. Okay, it was every, every I just look down and I see her just coming back and forth, and I'm just like I should I my first instinct is to say hi. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's super friendly. We've been together since uh, 2006. So well, um, she's been there since you were in the you were in there. She was there the whole time. Wow. Um, we've been through some some wild times. We've seen some some pretty uh we've seen some stuff she was the frg leader for third id for my company oh wait, um, she was she was she was service she was active no no she was just uh well not just she was my wife um my military spouse and i i can't say just a, a wife because there's so much more when we're when we're downrange or when we're when we're serving because there are emotional support there are backbone when we're in the field, when we're doing anything, when we come back, they're there for us. Um, and it's a man, it's a hell of a job. Um, I'm not gonna say it's the hardest job in the army, but it's it's definitely uh, <laughs> there, there, are, there are those out there who will say, you know, they'll talk about dependus, but then you get the then you get the working wives like that, and those women are literally the lifeblood of every man they're your queen and i like i said i i was always kind of hopeful and i was always wishful wishful for it but didn't work out but and then of course i mean i i knew i knew a couple of the uh at captain gate especially my first tour um his wife was uh was a phenomenal phenomenal woman and really did uh push to try and keep everybody informed back home of as what was going on and then uh, then captain then he got hit you might have seen him he's actually been on fox news a couple of times uh he actually was running for uh senator over in virginia and he lost his leg and his wife uh it went through hell with him getting him recovered um uh, but yeah gade lost his leg and uh I told him when he got when I got back, I said the very first thing I'd do is give him a salute. Sure as shit, he was there. 
Uh, we got, I mean, he got uh, replaced out with Norby, Captain Norby. And actually, uh, he was, I saw YouTube of Captain Norby a couple of, couple of months back, and it was good to see him. Um, yeah, we, we took a lot of hits. We lost some guys. So it's, it, when I, when I see family and I see good, good relationships that survive, it kind of offsets all the bitterness and all of the, all the pain that I see in society today. So cheers to you and your wife. Amen to that, brother. You're talking about the plaque, and this is the one mm -hmm. thing that I didn't even know about. I didn't even know we had a plaque. Yeah, there's a plaque right at the uh, entrance of Casey that was dedicated to the uh, the the lost of two seven two armor, and there's uh, there's a couple names on there, not to say the very least. Um, well, one of them would be Pomelo, and the other one would be Miller Jr. Miller was a hard one. Pomelo was was hard too. And then we, uh, the one night man shoes boys, they lost, uh, God, they lost so many boys. Oh, God. And Edmondson, Edmondson was one of the, uh, I don't, I don't, I tried when it comes to like, you know, people on TikTok, they ask me, How, did you kill anybody? You stacked bodies. And I'm just like, what kind of question is that? I'm like, I, and I try, I don't, I've said that, I've said this before, you know, I'm undiagnosed with ADD and slight autism, I, I probably will never get a diagnosis because it's damn near impossible for them to, to figure that out. But when I, when I think about the, when I, when I think about these questions and I'm just like, it's not something to brag about. It's not, it's just, it's, it was, the, it was our duty and it was our mission. And these guys wanted our blood and yeah, I, I get so many comments, and you do too. I've seen the comments on your TikTok. I've seen a couple of them on Instagram where they say some crap about defending oil or buying or stealing oil or some other BS. And I just look at them and go, if I could throw up every single bit of rage that I have out there for those people, it it would choke half the world, I swear, because it's just like – they don't understand the sacrifice. They don't understand the the pain that comes with that twenty one gun salute. They don't, and it's just like you, you until you actually are there, you don't get to speak on it. So it's, uh, it's a very solemn, <clears throat> very solemn occasion. the The people that we lost, we lost uh, to their own hand. Um, right. we were very lucky. Um, to come back i got blown up by an efp um it was aimed for a humvee but it uh we took our mrap that day and we almost took our humvee we almost took our humvee we spent 11 hours the previous day fixing our air conditioning so it could be fully mission capable a dumbass policy from battalion commander that ended up saving my life imagine that um but that would have gone through my tc's head that efp would have gone through his head ripped my legs off and gone on my driver's head um so we're grateful we took our uh, our mrap Set our MRAP on fire, lost all my snacks. Uh, that's terrorism. Um, that, <laughs> that is that is true war crime right there. That is a true war crime to lose all your snacks. I was pissed, dude. I was, I'm, to this day, I'm pissed. I lost, dude. Because like, when you go to the chow hole, you can only get two drinks at a time. And so, like, you drink one and you take one. And, like, because you got to do the honorable thing, right? We're bound by a code of conduct. I'm not just... Can I stuff my pockets full of stuff? Yes, but I should. Oh, I, I remember the I remember those blue falcons who would do that, and I'm just keep sons of bitch. It screws time. everybody, dude. And so I, I I finally got the perfect Gatorade to honey bun to rip it ratio stuffed into my cooler, and um, I lost it. I even had Brondo, the thirst mutilator that I'd written on the top of it from Idiocracy. Um, yeah, that was uh Oh shit. So were you guys on, on tanks, Humvees? What what, what were y'all on? What were you doing when you were downrange? First tour? Yeah. First tour uh and that first tour was tanks. Um sometimes we'd also I mean if they needed an extra boot on ground, they'd send me in a uh soft skin Humvee nine 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 eight. And that was that was back in the day when they, they didn't even have the eleven fourteen yet. So it was all 998s. It was all soft skins. And 
our guys got real creative real quick. They started carving out like Steve's, you know, solid hunk iron, Kentucky, you know, Kentucky armor. They just slapped doors on like nobody's business. And everybody's just like, there was no AC. There was, the, it was just, it was, everything was as made as is. This was when, you know, they started to realize, man, we need turrets for our freaking gunners and our Humvees. And they started slapping on these really crude, you know, then they were all, by the time, I mean, literally within like less than a week, they'd be rusted to shit, but it didn't matter. It was steel between you and the bullets. And I mean, is it was those they put sandbags under the, they put sandbags at the bottom to try and catch some shrapnel if an IED mm -hmm. went off, which was more a placebo than anything, but hell with it. It worked sometimes. Um, yeah, and they then, showed us so many videos of Humvees getting hit by freaking random stuff and just going flying. Like, there's nothing you're going to do if you get hit by a freaking deep buried IED in a Humvee. You're just going to go for a ride. Yeah, no, they, they, we lost so many of the boys that way, and we lost boys, and we had one, an LMTV got hit, and that, that, that finally cut off, Colonel Abrams finally had that cut off, because he, we had a, an LMTV get hit, and it had a lot of boys in it, and that was a mass Kazov Act event, and they, after that, you rarely ever saw us roll in an LMTV, unless it was an up-armored, up-gunned gun truck, basically, it was basically an early version of L LMTV. But it, or, or MRAP, but they didn't even they didn't even want to send them out because it was just too damned easy with those LMTVs for them to get hit and knocked out. Um, and yeah, they'll, they'll they'll let hobbies go by and they'll just hit the LMTV. Oh yeah, because they knew they, they they everybody talks about them. You know, they're just dumb. They're just you just they're fuck, not just they're whatever. not yeah. they're just a bunch of dumb farmers and whatnot. You're you. That's how I know that they're just ignorant pieces of crap when they say that. I'm like, you have no idea how smart your enemy is until you meet him. And I'm like, you. <clears throat> it's rough because I'm looking into, in retrospect, the everything that went into Iraq, at all the different causal, the, the, the things that happened, all the different factors, all the different decisions that were made, the decision to lay off the Iraqi army and creating an enemy overnight. Uh, I wrote an expansive paper on it in college. Um, not that I really care about that, but it's just, it, it, it got my, my, my cogs turning and looking at what the hell happened. And I have to think what, I think what kind of helped me like, yeah, I got blown up. I got rocketed, but we got to imagine in perspective, if I had the Chinese military rolling down my street, what the hell is, what, what am I doing? I'm yep. putting stuff on the road. I'm dropping mortars and propane tanks on their base. Like, come on. Um, there, there, there is some perspective in it. Um, my, my issue was not so much with the people who were legitimately pissed that we were there. It was the fact that by the time we were there, in, in, in my brain, conventional warfare leads to you know, you've you fought, your enemy government has capitulated, they are now being replaced by a provincial government, Saddam Hussein is out. You would think that more people would say, okay, now is the time to actually talk, not go at each other's throats. But that wasn't the mindset. The mindset was now here are all of these sheikhs, mullahs, and leaders like al Sadr. Mm -hmm. basically saying no this is mine because it's my birthright and you're just kind of going you do realize birthrights don't really exist right and they're like uh no it exists here i mean and al Sadr had a freaking i mean i love my boys so much for one seven cav and the rest but they all admitted you know that was the one group that one neighborhood where they just were like we can't fuck with him we can't his solder was just not to be fucked with. And he 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 maintained mostly his his ceasefire with us as a result. And we basically had to leave him to be, you know, just be like, okay, fine. You don't want us screwing around? Don't call us. My uh, Al Qaeda comes knocking at your door, you deal with it. And my that was company another thing went to Solder City when they opened yeah. it up. Previ on their previous deployment before I got there. Dude. The, the stories were really harrowing. 
like holy cow i need to get one of them on here or several of them on here so they can tell the story of when they opened up solder city and they went in and uh it was a people like i said they they the iraqi people the afghani people if you if too many americans i think watch too much hollywood and they get too soft and i i mean this with all due respect to and i love my i love my nation i love this nation i love i love our I, I, warts and all including all the bad parts of our history i love that we always strive for more but if you don't give if you do not put some respect on the names of the people who are your foes you are this close away from losing your life and it will be justified because you didn't give them that that smidgen of respect for their capabilities. Sodder was one of them. And uh, every, I mean, when we were in, and it, I, I was actually there in 2000, I was outside the Blue Wall um, in a combat outpost that it used to be a branch of the Ministry of Finance. Um, just, that uh, yeah, was my third tour. And that was when we moved over to MRAPS. And that's another thing is like you mentioned your MRAP versus mm -hmm. uh, a Humvee. I mean, it wasn't just the the politics behind it, but it was also the technology that that constantly shifted and grew as time went on. We went from, you know, soft skin 998s that were getting blown, like you said, sky high. And then they said, okay, we need an 1114. Okay, we got an 1114 now. Well, shit, now they got EFPs. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's get an MRAP. Oh shit, we got thermal sensors. How are we going to counteract this? We got to put rhinos on the thing. And people don't even know about this because it's not recorded. It's very there's just a few books out there that you might read about. Yeah, they the rhino, no it's idea. basically a, a, a glow plug or a, in the front of a black box to give you a little bit more standoff. And then there's a chain to trip the sensor if there's a sensor mm -hmm. on there. And then you've mm -hmm. got the, the jammers, and then I can't go too far into what the jammers do, or but they, they basically are for remote-controlled IEDs. They defeat those yep. um, in certain frequencies. Chameleons and, and chameleons and the other uh, ECM, electronic countermeasures, yep. the shit that the Navy uses constantly. We got it, and now we got it on the back of an MRAP or the back of Humvee. You're turning it on, and I'll never forget driving down the – driving down through Baghdad, looking over it out of my right shoulder or left shoulder and seeing, uh, you know, some guy just suddenly go, he's looking at his phone. <laughs> yeah, exactly, dude. Yep. And he, they, they'd start shaking. They'd like, yeah. They start pointing at the truck. Like, <laughs> and I'm just like, Hey, I'm driving here. All right. I'm sorry, but I'm, I can't trust you. Dude's coordinating a multi-million dollar business deal, like the ultimate sale of his life. And here we come on patrol and we just made a terrorist or we just made an insurgent or an enemy. Well, right. I'm good to go. Sometimes I think, yeah, I think they, I think, I think most of them took it in stride, but I'll never forget the one guy saying that he had four different phones for four different wives. And I just went, you fucking kidding me. Right. And he's like, no. And I'm like, you have four wives he's like yeah that's exhausting ah what and he had he had a different phone for each wife i'm like because in, in in that and you know how that is a lot of people are going using what no that's actually a thing they have to give one a piece to each woman to provide equally so it's like and that guy, he was a business owner obviously he had be he was in gold so he, he could afford it. man that's a that's a lot of work right there I'll stick with one, man. I, I don't. I, I would if I could have one, I would be happily with one. But it was just like it, it, I remember that so clearly and so vividly, and it, it just kind of. But it, the differences in the culture. I mean, you know, Bryn on TikTok, um, and she's actually a, she was a medic, and you know you know how we talk about our 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 lady soldiers our female soldiers as as valkyries because that's how we see them and i'll never forget we always had to have at least one valkyrie with every single unit that went out just purely for that reason because you touch one of their wives you might as well just sign your death warrant right there you talk about making an enemy that's a surefire way to do it is to break their break their customs and it's just like that's why the okay. fat's so important the female engagement team mm -hmm, mm -hmm. oh yeah 
It's oh, just yeah. culturally, it, it's just different. Like if we were to go into Poland, we were to go to Russia, like you just talk to whoever, it's no big deal. But it, when you when you deal with different different cultures, um, you know, Middle Eastern cultures, it's not the same. It's not just same. Uh, under Islam, it's 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 just different, and that's just it's, it's, it is what it is. Yeah, but and then there were and then there were also those moments where if they were if they were doing something that we would consider misogynistic, like if they were if they were you know holding too tight to their wife or they were getting getting rough with their wife, our natural instinct comes to the fore, but we can't do anything about that because that's not our you know the and the the legalities that yep. are, that are involved. I think that sucks. It's uh different. Yeah, there's yeah, a lot of stuff. Different. There's a lot of red tape with uh, um, we were attached to the Department of State, so we had all of the eyes upon us. Um, so there was really nothing we could do. Um, we were basically yes. up armored babysitters, sir. I know there's snipers out there, but you need to put your helmet on, sir. I know it's hot. I know it's hot, but you're gonna have to put your body armor on. I know, sir. I know. You're gonna have to buckle your seatbelt. I know it's we're only going down the road, but sir, if we get hit by an IED, y- you could get mangled. Like, and I remember one time uh, the truck in front of us gets hit by an EFP, and we're all calling them on the net like, two, you know, this is one respond, two, is three respond, and the truck is on fire, and all my friends are in front of it, and I'm just watching it burn in front of me, and your heart stops, it freaking stops, and you're just like, please get out please get out. And this truck's starting to burn. And all of a sudden the back door, the truck lurches to a stop back door opens, do start piling out. And you're just like, ah. and then the, the a couple minutes later, the, the PRT guy we had in the back with this provincial reconstruction team guys like, so I guess I'm not going to make my meeting today. And like, uh, yeah, I, I, I maintained my composure. Mm-mm. 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 Oh, I, I would, I would, and this was, I was, uh, in my second tour, we were actually doing the same thing as you guys, except we were doing it for first cab headquarters. And thankfully I did not have to deal with department of state. Um, most of the boys that I was driving were headquarters proper. So they were proper active military boys. Uh, they knew the drill. And they also understood that, yes, your meeting is important, but the mission is to keep you alive and to keep us alive. And if we say that route is red or that route goes black, we decide on a new route. You don't get to say nothing. You just sit back, sit tight, keep your eyes peeled. That's it. Absolutely. Most... I mean, it's it's hard, man. I'm a, I'm a go-getter. Like we, we could have theoretically. Yeah, we could have pushed. We could have hurt lockered it and just taken three trucks and, and left everything and for the Iraqis to scavenge or left to the Iraqi SWAT with it. But that's just not the way it went down. It just is what no. it is. Yeah. And that's another thing. A lot of people, I mean, folks are like, you know, they talk about loss of equipment, loss of lives. Like it's a theory for us. It's not a theory. It's a reality. And it's just it differentiates us when we hear like you know people are talking about what's happening now in ukraine and i'm looking at it and i'm looking at it with the with the perspective of somebody who's been there who's done that and i'm just kind of going okay bakhmut's gonna fall but what kind of material have they lost incredible amounts of men and equipment to take bakhmut the, the the amount alone with i mean just just for that, just you literally got less than a mile. That's all you moved. It's World War One all over again. You're like, now, and now I think to myself, and I'm just like, for a mile, you spent up 200 tanks and over 10,000 men dead. I just, and I'm thinking to myself, they don't have that many tanks left. They really don't. And then yeah. I'm like, I look back, back on it. And I'm like, now some people are, but a lot of people are saying, oh, it's the javelin, it's the javelin. I'm like, no, it's not just the javelin. When they sent their first group in, they sent their best, and their best abandoned their tanks. Yeah, they ran out of so, fuel and equipment and spare parts and everything. They went in without a salient logistics plan. It was 
And you and I both know if the if the U.S. Army were to do that, we would do every fucking thing in our power to get that vehicle and bring it back. Absolutely, Just, you'd send a whole freaking you send a whole tank company to recover a freaking tank. Yes. So it's just, it boggles my mind to, the, to this day. And I'm just like, my God, the amount of tech that they lost, just poof. And it's, I guarantee you that we, by supporting them, have mutual agreements that, hey, what? They have a T90M, right? Why don't we just go ahead and take one? Of, you guys can have one, but let's go ahead and take this one. And they put it on a C5 or C17, and they flew that punk ass over to Aberdeen so those old, the, the geniuses over there could disassemble it, put it back together, see how it works, and then they shot the ever-living piss out of it with everything that we possibly have. Have you heard about what's been, have you heard what they found with some of the T80s and T T72s that they've been bringing over? Mm-mm. That they don't have ERA blocks? Oh, yeah. So they've been taking them out, they've been selling them, or they've just been filling them with, like, sand or something. <laughs> the, yeah, I heard that. Um, <gasps> I'm not taking the A-Rat off of my Abrams. Mind you, did you guys have A-Rat tiles? No, no, we didn't. Dude, no, no. I, so we to to open the side skirt on the Abrams when you have a rat on, you have to take it all out. Oh my god, it's um not ideal. It's not I'm ideal. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm laughing at you, but I'm sorry. It's just funny to imagine you guys cussing out a, a green streak to every tank designer out there. Who came up with this motherfucking design? <laughs> I mean, it it, it works. Um, it works, but, but it's a bitch to have to get that track maintenance done. And it's one thing that people, it's frustrating because when, as a tanker, you want to believe that your tank is invincible, but unfortunately it's not. There is stuff that can kill your tank. I don't want to go too far into like some of the stuff that can kill the tank or where you have to hit it. I mean, if you, if you understand basic science and, and technology, then you can figure it out. But the tank is not invulnerable, and if you put enough explosives in the road, you're going to eventually have enough power to lift the tank off and flip it over, and it'll or penetrate when we, when we got When we got hit, it, it was uh, – we got hit with uh, 152s, which were the, which were the standard, um, and that happened multiple times, and it wouldn't even take the track off, just to put it in perspective. And then they we, put more and more. Then and that's more. when they started stacking. And when they started mm -hmm. stacking, that's when they started seeing more results. But it it took but that but that was the disadvantage to them was because it took them that much longer to bury that much explosives, which opened them up to our snipers, that opened up, up to our marksmen and to our Apaches and Cobras. Yeah, you've got ISR flying over, you can be like, hey, there's dudes digging in the road, and then just Hellfire all of a sudden will come visit them, and now they're Oops. all of a sudden more open-minded. Yep, suddenly they're very open-minded, and it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And, and we got, I mean, there was, there was camera footage that got shared around among us from some of the boys over there, and we were just like, good, good. Just now, granted, we also now we had to be mindful of it because we couldn't guarantee that somebody digging a hole wasn't simply just digging a culvert, which was what some of them were doing. So they would wait until they found a truck that actually pulled up that had like several AKs with an RPG in the back. And we can ident you can you can let I think we can let the viewers know this. That's how good our thermals are, especially with the the Apaches, the Cobras, and now the new A2 Seps V2s. We can identify weapons. Oh yeah, they'll zoom in in the tads and they'll just look right at it um, and yeah. be like, and yep. Just, and, yep, they got it. They got an RPG seven. They got two AKs. They got one one pistol, and they're what? Wait, they're bringing something out. Yep, that's a one five two. Okay, hit it. I mean, just oh, done, done and done. And the other part was. Because we actually found out some of them were taking advantage of those who are mentally, uh, mentally. Uh, yeah, he, that's heartbreaking. Yeah, and they taking advantage of the retarded, of of the mentally ill, of the mentally challenged, and then saying, "Oh yeah, just go dig this hole here and put this in it, 
or go walk mm-hmm. into this market and push this button. Yeah. When we heard this, we, we were just like, you're fucking kidding me. They're doing what? And it, it just brought our anger level up to another level. Using kids like, to throw RKG threes. Yeah. Just you. That's the work of, I mean, you can say it's smart, but it's also cowardly as fuck. Yeah, so never just, never it, bring kids into a, into an adult no, fight. That's no. that regardless of cultural lines, you never bring that, kids into an adult fight. I think that's one of the biggest differences with the Middle East, the South American and and Africans because they will use child armies. And for us being raised up the way we are, we see kid, we don't think threat. But they see it and they just go, "You're a man now." Here, go do this. And you're just like. I've got a story for another time about that, but it's. uh, Yeah, that's not one of those things that's. uh, Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a rough way to fight. The asymmetric warfare is incredibly difficult because there's one, there's nobody is in uniform. Two, everybody's a suspect. And three, when you go through training, they're like, this is your IED training. These are what IEDs look like. And you get downrange, everything looks like an IED. Absolutely everything is right on the side of the road. It looks suspicious. And you're just like, you know what? I finally got to a point where, like, after I got hit with an EFP, after I got rocketed a bunch of times, I'm like, you know what? I just hope it's quick. If it has to happen, if it's my time, and that's one thing, you can do everything perfectly right. You can have the perfect tactics. You can be scanning. You can be doing all your battle drills. You can have all your 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 uh, CLS bags stocked. But sometimes if it's your time, it's your time. And that's very hard to, it's, oh, yeah, which reminds me of, Edmondson and his his squad leader I actually walked out to him in my first tour and he had a couple of Listerine bottles of whiskey and his squad leader and Han- I mean Edmondson was gone and Hanson was gone now and their squad leader was out there and I walked out to him and he he had that Listerine bottle and I sat down with him and I shared about three shots with him, you know, against general order number one, no drinking in the field. Yeah, I have but opinions about that. Mm. I do too. But I shared those shots with him. And he looked over at me and he said, Pharaoh, my entire squad is gone. And he said, and every single time I think about it, I realize that I could have been in the chair. And he'd still be here. And I'm like, yeah, and you wouldn't be. Because he'd just gotten back from his two-week leave. And he was supposed to go out that day. But they said, no, you got 24 hours. Take it, reacclimate, get used to the heat. And that was the the day we rolled out and got hit. Survivor's guilt, man. Yeah, and it's like, and, and there's, and like you said, You can do everything perfect, and it's not going to matter. We turned that corner of that dirt-ass road, and it was the same freaking – it's the same fucking road that had been – it had been red and black all fucking year. And we all knew it, Mm -hmm. but you couldn't tell. You couldn't fucking tell. Everything looks the same. Occasionally, you'd be like, hey, that's a fridge. What the hell is that doing? You know? Yeah. Well, I got blown by a pile of trash, so. Yeah, no, mine was a – mine was a whole – or, well, it was a pretty obvious hole. The, for the, I saw the discoloration in the dirt, and I knew. And like I said on TikTok, I just knew. It was instinctive. And But there was no – there. I was like, you don't stop on it. Everybody – and that was one of the people that were – I got to make it – well, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll, let, I'll review them to send them over here to, to watch this. Basically, when, when they did that, they, the guys were like, well, wait, why would you keep going? Because you keep fucking going. Mm-hmm. You don't stay on the X. You don't stay where there might be a secondary charge. Yeah, you push to the kill zone, especially if there's Overwatch. Doctrinally, yeah. you want to have Overwatch of any sort of um, obstacle or any sort of minefield or any sort of potential threat. Um, yep. 
So as they dismount, as we saw, especially in 2004, as they would dismount, all of a sudden snipers would start engaging the dismounts. Um, they did that to us. They did. They did that to us on. Fuck. I don't know. They, they did that all year and it w- it became by rote. It was just like we expected it. And the tanks, we we could get away with it because we've got fucking thermals. We can see ass. Mm-hmm. But the infantry had nothing and the Marines had nothing. And they were just they're just out there basically with just their eyeball mark one yep. blindly trying to figure the fuck out where the hell this was coming from. And they every single the the number of guys that come up to me and be like, you know, I, you have, the, you know, and they say thank, they thank me, and I'm like, I'm, I was just the driver, bro, but they thank me because the tanks were there to save them, and they never forget. And I'm just like, it chokes me the fuck up, bro. It it chokes me up to 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 know that 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 my boys and I were were that shield for our brothers and sisters. It just it it makes me feel a lot and it makes you like appreciate the training and for any anybody who's thinking about becoming a tanker anybody who is a tanker currently these are some of the stories that when you get down range you you better have have not bullshit your way through gunnery like seriously take that shit seriously because eventually you're gonna have dudes that need you right just now to hit that perfect shot and you need to be a gunslinger you need to be able to get that heat round or that impact round now, right through that window, or wherever it needs to go. You need to have that, that coax needs to be dialed, man. And that's one thing, if you're watching this, and you're maybe uh, one of the the leaders, let your troops freaking shoot as they go out the the gate. Let them have somewhere to to confirm their zero. Yeah, you're going to burn up a little bit of ammo, but I guarantee you, they're going to know whether or not that solenoid fires. They're going to know whether or not that gun works, whether or not, you know, whatever. We're not going to be, you know, test firing our freaking main gun. We're going to be test firing our small arms. Let yes. let us do that. We need to do that. Um, and then also make damn sure that when you get back, that you all go through your proper procedures to clear your guns and make sure that that damn bit, that that damn, because I cannot count the number of NDs that we had oh, yeah. in just about every single, every single, never never ceases to amaze me some some of the guys that go in and somehow make it to high rank and then they don't even know how to clear their weapon and that of course that that's sorry to move back that's met tc dependent if you have to have noise and light discipline i understand you can't test fire fair enough but yeah lots of nds remove the source of ammunition before you start doing anything treat every weapon as if it were loaded please leaders and, and soldiers if you see this understand me when i say this i cannot count Oh, the fuck it. I had a 50 go over my head that, back in Camp Victory. Straight up, that just straight buzz vroom, over my head. And I'm going, are you fucking kidding me? And sure as shit, somebody else was, was at the clearing barrel, and they elevated their 50, not paying attention, tripped the butterfly, boom, and it flew right, right over headquarters. That should be a mandatory MOS. reclass to MOS 98 Zulu, which is a pop-up target. <laughs> It was so fucking worth. It was so bad, and like I said, I was literally on guard check right outside fucking division headquarters that day. Uh. <laughs> so yeah, it's it. Pay attention. Make sure you get your your also and another thing. Always get your radios checked. Always make sure your comms are up. Make sure you, everybody can hear each other clearly, because in the piss and communication of battle you all know damn good and well you're not going to be pro- proper and perfect in everything no people the are going to be stepping over each other on the net your oh radio is going to dump its fill bring a battery damn it hopefully yes, <laughs> bring several uh it, no and bolt and no bolt and yeah no bullshit it was like every single truck every, by, by the time we got to i mean with the with the tank obviously tankers know the shit is jacked into the engine we're good but for Humvees and for MRAPs, if we had we had three radios at minimum, and every single radio had at minimum one backup, and in some cases we had two backup backup batteries for each radio. It was it was not to be fucked with. You did not want to lose that fill. 
And if you did, you were you were going to hear about it when you got back. So that's for future warriors and future leaders to to keep in mind. And I hesitate to say this. Do not engage in in cover fire for just for the sake of cover fire. And when I say this, I mean that the number of times where I heard guys say that they burned through 210 rounds of ammunition in a protracted gunfight was way too high. Like some of these guys were just burning through am- ammunition like it was water. Oh, yeah. Contagious gunfire. And and yeah. And it's just like you can't you can't always do that because you're you have no guarantee, especially in asymmetric warfare, that you're going to be able to get back to base to get more ammo judicious so, marksmanship he's judicious marksmanship, marksmanship and judicious understanding of when cover fire is absolutely necessary suppressing but, yeah. as you have the maneuver element uh, you know actively engaged um, and for god's sakes make sure you do a head count before you head back to base because we actually left a boy well one of our bo- one of our units left a boy out in the middle of ramadi mm, dust one <laughs> that boy i shit you not this boy has a story for the ages he dressed himself in a muslim woman's hijab the full get up get the middle of the fucking night and he dresses up in the full black garb wraps his face and hoofed his fucking ass all the way back to bob ramadi before his unit could actually figure out that they fucked up and left their boy back out there, he comes up to the gate guard, whips it off, and just goes, I'm friendly. And they looked at him and said, the fuck are you doing? He's like, I'm with such and such brigade. Can you please get me a ride over to my, my unit? He was pissed. Heads <laughs> should have rolled for that. Oh, uh, there was... That's a Had relief in place. This one too. The boy who decided to show how to um, fire an AT4, only it wasn't a training AT4 that he pushed the button on. That's a big explosion. That's a that's a hell of an event. That motherfucker went between both barracks and hit the fucking Connex for the weapons repairman. Why is he firing AT? What the. <laughs> He was, he had the, he had the, he had it. He thought it was a mock-up. And how you forget that the yellow tip is supposed to be for training. The fucking green is normal. And that shit's heavy. Yeah, but he lifted it up and he just, he's like, he was showing them how to do it. He's like, yeah, and then you lift this up and then you press this button. And the (laughs) second you hit that button, that fucker blew. (laughs) Oh my God. I knew a dude when I worked at Northrop, he was a prime Marine. He was like, yeah, I fired an RPG down a hallway. And I'm like, I looked at him I'm like down a hallway. You say, how was that? And, and he's like, yeah, dude, we, we, we shot right out the window and hit somebody. I'm like, tell me more about the event. Like what happened? What, what was the, what was the effect? And he's like, yeah, it just went right out the window. I'm like, no, like, was everybody okay inside the building? He's like, oh yeah, we were all fine. There was, yeah, it was, we, I just shot it. I'm like, Dude, if you fire an RPG down the hallway, think about the backblast shooting that inside of a building. Like, like everybody's just like all their their stuff's gonna fly off. Everybody's gonna be all yeah. yeah. Oh my god, like that would suck. <laughs> yeah. Don't don't yeah. fire that again inside of the hallway, please. Like no, if, if... <laughs> oh my god. no, you don't do that. And the and the and that was one of the things like, and that was another thing that that they learned in Fallujah especially was the was the radius for concussive effects of the main gun in tight quarters. Yeah, I absolutely. Mean, and the Marines were pissed with us at some time, at some points, but at the same point, they were still loving us because they knew it's gone. You know, that we were taking heavy fire from this building. Okay. There's no building there no more. You can keep going. Yep. Hey, but shoot my ears shoot are completely building? shot right now. Yeah. Shoot it. All right. Yeah. They shoot it. Okay. Are you sure? <laughs> I, I mean, and I, I I laugh about it now, but of course, it, at that point, it was very fucking serious. And a lot of people ask me, "Were you at Fallujah?" And I say, "No, I was in Ramadi." And they they're like, "Ramadi, where's that?" And I'm just like, "It's it's at the other end of the the triangle." 
And I and when that actually when the second battle happened, uh, we all just kind of looked at each other and we all agreed they're coming because they're not going to they they didn't stick around. Not all of them stuck around. They knew and they didn't want to die and they wanted to move someplace where it was a little bit more quiet. Uh, but you were, right. you were saying you were in Ramadi. So you were my company had a platoon. Actually, I think the whole company was there in OIF three. Uh, Dealer Company 269 Armor was in Ramadi in, from like 04 to 05, I believe. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they had some. They, our company had a like a wall of, of pictures, so to speak, of all the different things that had happened throughout their tours. And one of the pictures was in Ramadi. They had an RPG that went right into and stuck in the window of this Humvee. And I'm like, lucky son. <laughs> I remember that one. Uh, I remember that one. That was, I, I, yeah, that would be harrowing. Like, yeah, dude. Um, that so. happened more than once. And that was actually, um, I mean, they still had a, they had a shitload of RPG sevens. There are some of the boys actually got them to believe that we had, uh, some form of electromagnetic field around our, our, our tanks that would actually interfere with the, uh, the firing mechanisms on the RPG sevens, unless they rolled them up in duct, duct tape. Oh, and we actually convinced them of that, and they started. So they, some of these idiots were actually doing that. They were actually wrapping duct tape around their RPG sevens, which of course made them even less aerodynamic, and they just fuck up even worse. And we were just like, okay, don't tell them, don't that's, tell them, let that's let them do it. Um, but yeah, there. I mean, there were, and that reminds me of the day. That was the day we. Uh, well, that's for another day. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you want to bring me back on later. But yeah, stories upon stories, brother. We got so many. Of course, I man. Mean, it's always good to talk to another tanker because there's so much experience out there. There's so many, like, there, there's so much collective knowledge that so many of us bring. And you have a unique story, you know, being from 272 Armor, being part of Deuce Tank, going over to Iraq out of Korea. And you did three tours. You did one in Ramadi. Where were your other two at? Both. Uh, that the second one was in Baghdad with First Cav HQ, okay. and we were out of Camp Victory and Camp Liberty. Okay. That was biop. I've been there. Then, it's nice. Oh, it's, yeah. And then the third tour was the Sadr City. It was out just outside Sadr City, and that was when we moved over to Amrams. So yeah, I got. I basically got the whole experience in three different vehicles and with two different units. So, and now today people talk about it and they look at me and they say, man, you've been through some shit. And I'm like, you know, when I started, I've always tried to be humble about it. I I've seen some of what now I realize I saw a lot more than a lot of other people saw. And, but I, I mean, the, the, the real gung ho slingers, like, um, Saren Gwynn and, and the guys like Sean Ryan and whatnot, I'm nowhere near their, their caliber in my opinion, but um, I like to, th I like to always say that I, I was the least of, uh, I was the least of some of the best. So I enjoy watching some of Sean Ryan's stuff. I haven't seen a, a whole bunch of it, but everything that I've watched, I've definitely enjoyed. And I've been able to sort of under, you know, have share that kinship with, yeah. um, just some of the some of the thoughtful points that him and a lot of the other guests put out there. You know, they were they, um, they really do. I mean, and their mentality, of course, is different from our mentality because they're trained up in, in to be, you know, as lethal as they are in a CQC environment versus us, where we're trained. If we're in CQC, somebody's fucked up. <laughs> we did a lot of of a uh, battle drill six training. We would do, we did shoot house after shoot house after shoot house. I went to Hawaii. You can throw me in any freaking stack you want and I can perform in Excel. I can, I, I, think, I, I think I could hold up, but I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm the, I'm elite. I can, I can hold up. I can slice a pie and I can watch it and I can watch a corner, but you know, it's the old, the, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not 18 and I'm not 22 no more. So I can't breach. I've never been to a breacher's course. So uh, if you hand me the deck cord and a breacher's thing, I'll just look at you. Um, hand That's me a it. shotgun, I'm... hand me a battering ram, uh, the hooligan kit. I, pff, 
That reminds yeah, right. me of my boy Willard and put it he he and uh, coffee they had a they had a grappling hook and they actually climbed up onto a roof one raid. Oh yeah, dude, you get down with it. If somebody says, "Hey, we need you to go snatch that dude out that second store window," bro, we'll drive the tank right up next to that thing, and somebody will hop out the turret and just go reach in and grab somebody. That night they had a that we had the MRAPs, and they decided that they wanted to rappel up onto the roof of uh, one of the buildings in order to to get top coverage, and they did it. And I was just like, you crazy son of a bitch, but he did. They did it, and. I love, we lost coffee. A few, we lost coffee, uh, 2000 and God, it was 2017. I remember he was a young guy. He was young, young. Uh, he was a really big bodybuilder guy, but he went out on his bike and, uh, apparently something happened and he went, we lost him. It was a shame too. He was a good kid. I liked him just, man, we, we lose. So we look, I hate 22 a day. I hate it. Every single time that I hear guys starting to get out of it, I'm just like, brother, don't do it, please. Yeah, please. it's not pleasant because um, you never know how many people who actually care about you and love you. Um, I planted far too many friends in the past few years, and it, it, it it's burned into my memory watching a little brother um, and, and uh, my buddy Mike's mom lose their mind as we lowered him into the earth. And, uh, man, you, you guys are loved, whether you know it or not, whether or not you feel it or not, you're loved and you're valuable. And, um, I don't care. I don't care if you don't believe in God, I believe in God and I, I believe too. God puts us on this reason. I, I believe we're here for a reason and I, I'll be, I'll be flat out with y'all. If, if any tankers, warriors, any of you soldiers, and even to those who are civilian, and if you're feeling low, understand me in this. Even though you may not know it, I still give a damn. So stick around with us, we'll, please. Absolutely. We need you guys to, to enjoy our content and to be sustained by our ridiculous antics and uh, listen to stories and uh, know that it's not so bad. It's, it's a, and suicide is a... It's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Now, I understand there are certain things that are terminal. Um, yeah. That that um, is a different conversation. But that's a uh, different conversation for a different time. But we're let's... talking financial, legal, um, marital. Reach uh, out, open up. If you need help, financial help, or anything else, you reach out to people. Let us know. We will. There are people who will help. Believe me. Absolutely. Believe I'm usually me. on my. Uh, one of my many devices creeping around the internet at all hours of the evening. And I generally will respond to DMS as fast as I can get to them. Now that doesn't mean to send me pictures of your, of your glorious phalli or phallus. Uh, no, um, no. But, but please don't. Um, but we're here to talk. We're here to um, listen, encourage. And uh, yeah, these stories that we have, um, they're just they're from asymmetric warfare. Folks that go through conventional warfare have very different things. I've watched almost all of the combat footage that's come out of Ukraine. Watching the um, and this is one thing. So I I always thought from largest scale possible in the army. I thought you know what this is just an asymmetric fight. This isn't the big fight. We need to be training and active and ready for the big fight. And, and it's easy to look at some of this footage and cherry pick and be like, yeah, well, they could have done this. They should have done that. I, the fact remains, I'm not there. I don't know the actual, the, what exactly is going on in the battle space. All I can do is extrapolate from specific scenes and scenarios. But some of the lessons learned that I would say are necessarily when you have an armor formation with a threat like drones, with a threat like loitering munitions, Integrating a SHORAD, a, a short-range air defense uh, and drone jamming capability, at least at the company level, preferably at the platoon level, is going to save lives. They've um, been using the ZSU-23-2s as, uh, as an anti-infantry, anti-material weapon recently. And I've been wondering why they don't incorporate that or a, or a double 50 or a quad 50 or 14.5 millimeter as an anti-drone measure oh well that, i don't 
when it comes into civil considerations, um, what goes up must come down, especially in a civil area like that. And yeah. it's, it's where it could be oriented. I'm thinking more precision fires, like having those stingers, having the strellas, and then having the drone jammer. There's like, have you seen those things? They look like halo guns. They're they're designed to be drone jammers, and they basically uh, interrupt the link between the drone operator and the drone itself. Um, integrating that at the platoon level is going to prevent those things from putting warheads on a on a Leopard 2 or an Abrams or a T-64 or whatever. And another another final note, if I may. Um, yes, netting, sir. because even just something to catch an RKG they do. from above they work. would help them out immensely. But I don't, I mean, the number of times where I've seen the, them just drop it and there's, there might be like a small net, but it's like, it's paltry. So maintenance and upkeep folks it's a it's a big thing and the the other thing that i mean and the, you 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 mentioned the nitpicking and it brought to mind the uh, the ukrainian tank that they lost the amount of vehicle identification that you have to do in that sort of active oh war zone when there are the same chassis those two were i mean and you know me i'm a, I'm a war thunder guy and everybody jokes about war thunder but those guys were literally at point blank fucking range and Neither one knew there wasn't there was no confirmation, I think, until the Russian finally realized I'm staring at a Ukrainian. Oh, shit. But it was less than 50 meters that they were apart. And you're just thinking. You have to be there, be awake. You did either they were asleep or they weren't even in the tank at that point. That's the only thing I can think of. Not it's scared. one of those things. There's so many different factors. It's like, are they on comms? Are they on a different net on comms? Are they like, are they doing a passage of lines? Is there one being a relief? Like, is this the relief unit coming up to replace? There's so much that goes into that. It's easy to cherry pick and be like, oh, they should have known. Like, no, no, no. Unless you understand how complicated the battle space is, that it's not that easy. Now, if it's there's a tank, I'm, it's why I'm so adamant that when we when we see these when we see the leopards and the do you call them leopards or do I you call, call them the leopards? leopards. I, I, See, I le the, leopard, leopard. I don't know. What's it? I use the Southern that. German pronunciation. That's why that's the thing. Um, but the the leopards and the the challengers and these Abrams when they finally do arrive, but when these tanks get to the front, it's going to simplify their their missions so much in regards to vehicle identification because they can just move the rest of their guys out of the way and just be like. Whatever's in ahead of you is, you know, enemy. It, <laughs> you know, I, I, I can't could, even I, imagine being there. That's just. I could imagine it, but at the same time, I can't. I don't want to. <laughs> neither do I. But the thing about it that really gets me is like, I know the solution and it involves a single bullet involved in, involving a single person, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. And I'm just like, you know, it would be so easy if a certain person who deserves a bullet needs to just, we're just simply say, okay, I'm not actually going to be able to do this. I'm not actually going to be able to succeed at this. I better stop this special military operation while I'm at it. What's the commander's intent? <laughs> as far as I know, and as this is the, I mean, this is from other people who have actually done YouTubes on this and also done strategic analysis. It's, the end state is the of this special military operation, as stated by the by the aggressor in this case, is that you know they cover it up under oh they're saving Donbass. They have no interest in what was going on in Donbass. They were encouraging what was going on in Donbass. But what the aggressor in this case is doing is wanting to limit the amount of lanes of travel that an invading force could make. And also opening up open water ports for themselves because the aggressor only has one open water port that is open year round. That's Murmansk. Without that, they have no other open water ports. Now they have one, and a second one thanks to Crimea mm -hmm. on the eastern but coast of Crimea. Still three others, including Odessa, that are even larger in Ukraine. And they haven't taken and, Odessa. No, they haven't. They want it. They whether they get it is an entirely different ball game because what is what small force of the Ukrainian Navy there is is stationed at Odessa and they're not going to play nice no. as they have shown their flagship. 
Oh, dude, that was rough. And then watching, there was a video that somebody posted on like, and it was completely in keeping with what, with what we've seen thus far of the maintenance of of military vehicles on the Russian side, shall we say. Like half of the vehicle didn't, half of the ship didn't work. These turrets didn't, If when they had the communication system turned on, they couldn't run the, the air defense system. Otherwise they interfered with each other. And like they had like the batteries or the, the mechanisms for like two guns working. And like, bullshit. Yeah. Like, they, they're no just, bullshit. Are you not, you're not bullshitting me right no, now. No, it's, 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 uh, who the hell did, is it Ward Carroll? It's somebody. It's somebody pretty well known. Did the video on it? Oh, if Ward said it, I would believe him in a heartbeat. It's, but I'll have to double check. Yeah, Holy shit. we'll have to figure out who that is. But it's it's somebody pretty credible. It just kind of boggles my mind that we were we were tra- I mean, yeah, we were we were taught asymmetric warfare, but we also learned conventional on the side. We were still getting ready for the big one. Yeah, you still do your react artillery fire, and then you see that line of Russian vehicles not reactor they're like waiting for the officer to do something is there no nco core is there no like no get off of the road like go let's get into a wedge let's start advancing forward and like and then the minefield one what are you doing yeah. like let's just send another one boom that one got hit let's send another one boom like no the, they, <laughs> they don't have an nco core their ncos are basically glorified specialists in their opinion and in their command structure, the NCO cannot correct an officer. That is how different they are from our mindset. Their officers have full authority over everybody, including the NCOs. Whereas with us in the U.S. Army and some of the other you know, Western nations, including now the Japanese and the Koreans, it's if the NCO countermands the order, the lieutenant better fucking listen and say, well, why is he doing this? Because that man has hit at least 10 years on you. The Russians don't have that. They have a very strict dogmatic approach to – it is almost Napoleonic in its, in its way. And it's, it's – it's, I hesitate to say it's stupid because it's not stupid. It's worked for them in the past in World War II. But at what cost? That is the question. To Quantity most of us, quality. yeah, for uh, for most of us in the in the West, it's a question of you know, and we ha- we hesitate to lose even a few soldiers, and you know our will to fight starts to drain away, especially if we don't have civilian you know civilian support. If we don't have the support of the people at home, it literally just it evaporates. But these people are this type of people who won't even bat an eye. The weeping mothers and the daughters and the wives don't mean a thing to them. And you're just like, where, where, where is this mindset? Where, where did this come from? Because it's not, it's, not, it's not ingrained in us. To them, it's just, it is what it is. And yeah, you're just I mean, like, I like to fight. I'll still, I'll still push through, but depending on oh, the mission. No, yeah, but, they're in like, but again, you know, and that is the difference between an asymmetric warfare that lasts eight to 12 to 20 years like the global war on terror with endless scope creep and no desired end state and just exactly no desired end state that that fucks with everybody versus a conventional warfare like the gulf gulf war where literally we have the state of mission we have the desired end state boom 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 Mm -hmm. done okay that's it as You're soon as we cross this out. LOA, then we are rounds complete. We're going to go wheels up back to the U.S. of A. Uh, that, I mean, and those are the types of fights that the, the U.S. Army in conventional warfare will just sweep. The U.S. Marines will sweep. The U.S. Navy will absolutely dominate. And a lot of people say, have asked me, you know, what do I think about what? This is, a, this is another thing. Do they understand that we actually withhold so much of our power simply by not engaging civilian traffic? I mean, we I look mean, at the highway of death in uh, Iraq. That was. I, 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 and this is a quite, I mean, in World War II, you know, everybody talks about war crimes and they, they come at me and they say, oh, you're a war criminal. Do they call every single submariner who hit a civilian Japanese troop, uh, Japanese ship a war criminal? Because that was total war. And then you think about the amount of task force that we have in the U.S. Navy today and the amount of missiles that we have. 
How many ships could we sink in the modern world with just a flick of our wrist and simply shut down economies? Absolutely. I mean, we could harpoon everything and just that would be it. it so it just it reminds me of what Teddy Roosevelt says. It reminds me of what Teddy Roosevelt said. Walk softly, carry a big stick. Teddy it's Roosevelt's a great uh, – I really enjoy his contribution to our country. Um, I'm a naturalist way. myself. I, I greatly appreciate way. our natural parks. And that's one thing to heal um, some of the wounds of, of the army things that we've had to experience. For me, being out in nature, reconnecting with nature, grounding, and just seeing the beauty that we have on this planet and being so thankful for it. Um, it's helped me. Uh, how I'm sure you've dealt with issues um, getting after getting out of the Navy or the Marine Corps, or whatever we were in. Um, what what has helped you like become a normal human being again, if there even is such a thing? No, I'm not normal in the least. I never was, um, but I ended up. Uh, I ended up. Well, my 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 story is a little bit sadder um several failed relationships um stay stay down in houston slept on the floor of my apartment for a few years and uh my family basically has been a linchpin for me um i have a very few friends that and then i have good acquaintances like yourself who who give me a reason to keep pushing through in the meantime i uh i make models oh nice is that an f6f so, it says uh, F4F. F4F, oh, yeah. She's, that was she's the Wildcat. It's not the Hellcat, it's the Wildcat. Yeah, and that is, uh, and then there's, uh, let's see, what else? What else? Oh, this is Mother War Games. And uh, I write. Oh, excellent. You've act, you're have you a published author. Yes. Well, I mean, self-published, if you if you want to call it that. But, hey, yeah. that's. She's a chonker. That's um, published, that's dude. That's series. impressive. And also, Hiroshima. Ah, beautiful. And then, of course, there's also War Thunder, which I'm actually planning to feed the snail today. I, they just released the Phantom Two, and I want to get it. It's a, it's a, it's a hefty plane. It's sixty bucks, but. I can afford it right now. <laughs> See, I play DCS World. That's that's my main thing. I fly fake airplanes. I am a huge sim. I have heard a lot about that one, and I would love to, but I don't have the GPU for it. No, I got you. I, I've spent far too much money. I sold one of my motorcycles to, uh, to one, buy a washing machine, and two, to buy an expensive throttle and joystick so that I could enjoy the video game. Um, I also play Gunner Heat PC. Gunner Heat PC is... Dude, I love it. I don't really War Thunder. I hate grinding. I'd rather jump into an M60A3 or jump into an IPM1 and just start slanging rounds at things. It's so... I do enjoy, uh, I do. It's I do enjoy Gunner EPC a lot. I actually I got on their Patreon recently because I wanted to support the project. It's a fantastic, fantastic support. When they go multiplayer, they may very well steal me away from War Thunder, but... I've been grinding at War Thunder now for over two years, uh, actually four four years because I got ba I I cuss too much. They chat they they perma banned me on my other account. I cuss way too much. I got gotcha. you. Um, but um, yeah, I've been playing War Thunder for so long, it became basically another tonic for me. Um, and romance novels, you know, I read romance novels. I read sci fi. Uh, if you look up on TikTok, Smoke Pit Fairy Tales. He does a similar sci-fi genre. There's Dan Krenner as well, who also does uh, fantasy. And uh, yeah, I would recommend. I've got several recommendations for for guys and gals. Uh, Galaxy's Edge. There's some there's some OIF and OEF veterans who write uh, science fiction that is really nitty gritty military, and it's it's really well done. Really, I really write well done. a novel based off of the armor experience as if korea went hot just like hey all of a sudden we're out at twin bridges and uh the artillery sailed right over us and we got word that kc had been hit and that part of seoul was returning the south koreans have mobilized and do let me just say this 
if it came if 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 the peninsula went hot i would not want to be north korea they would get stomped on by the south koreans with their technology their training their equipment their fortifications um north the dprk is using stuff from the 60s and 70s and they have the starving thing, troops the one thing that's really going to the one thing that's really going to and the, the only thing the only sympathy that i have for it is uh, I mean, people, the civilians of North Korea, I have no hate to. I, I want have no freedom hate for them. For them. Yeah, I want, them, I want to them, succeed. I want them to have the same freedoms as the South Koreans. Absolutely. But the other thing that would go ha- that would happen in the in the if if the, if it went hot, if Kim Jong, what's his face, Un, if Un, Un, yeah, if Un decided to get a bug in his britches and actually do this bullshit. There is an entire swath of natural preserve, basically, in the DMZ that is so fucking rare because it is natural as all get out. Nobody's touched it in over 50 years. There are literally a dozen endangered species within that area that exist nowhere else. If you go hot and wipe out an entire ecosystem, basically, for your self-glorification, what does that make you? I mean, realistically, it just it just it boggles the mind. So I'm just like, maybe we should just leave that. You know, when 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 unity finally comes to the peninsula, hopefully, I hope it does. They will be able to leave that as not so much a scar, but a healed wound on the landscape to remind themselves of that there is still beauty in everything. Because the Korean, I mean, they have been conquered by. The Mongols, the Chinese, the Japanese, and yet their people have endured for over three thousand years. That's a testament, right there. Korea. That's something. That, that's something that to, to just go. That's impressive. You know, that it would is. be my hope. South Korea is incredibly. Um, it's just from an economic standpoint, looking where they were in 1953 to where they've come today where they export everything they create everything uh, domestically where i remember i was on staff duty and i was looking at the key box and it was made by hyundai the chair was made by like daewoo or something i'm like what they make everything they it's such a self-sustaining economy it is truly fantastic to see um the the seemingly unlimited potential that south korea has been able to um, and it wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't as easy as all that, you know, we know that, but, I mean, it took them, they had to go through a couple of military dictators and they had to go through a couple of false starts, but when they finally got their, their traction underneath them, it actually started to get up and running, really, they, they showed who they are as a people. And it's just absolutely phenomenal to see. And you're just like, that is what you want to see across it. That's what I would want to see uh, in just about everywhere looking north on the dmz there was one light out there and then you turn south and it looks like las vegas as far as the eye can see now for if you're a dark sky fan who likes to look at astronomy maybe north korea is the place for you but if you like industry and things to do and and just an incredible economy south korea's got it going on and and no i'm not saying people should go to north korea for any reason other than to just you know after reunification go take a look at (laughs) it the the culture especially i mean between the k-pop the the k-dramas everything that they've done and their movie industry they rival hollywood in some in some ways between them and tokyo they basically so there's sometimes where they make hollywood look bad oh the green soap operas and yeah they're fantastic fantastic. i don't know what the hell they're saying but they look good and that's why that's why we get subtitles (laughs) best i can do is ask ajima for a soju and (laughs) but oh god well, yeah. Brandon, I appreciate you coming on. It looks like we just have a, a couple minutes left. Do you have any closing things that you want to share with the uh, with the folks out there? Like I said, it's been an honor. Uh, thank you for inviting me, my man. And really, I it's going to be. I hope to speak with, again with you. We can share a few more stories. Um, hopefully, we'll have more on this uh, the situation in Ukraine. Hopefully, by the next time we talk, they'll actually be talking about peace. That would and, be nice. And, that would be. Um, but thank you for the opportunity. And to everybody watching this, I mean, whether you're a soldier or whether you're a troop supporter, God bless you for what you do. 
Um, thank you for holding the line with us and stay in the fight. Ooh. Sounds good, brother. Well, thank you so much for coming on and uh, we will catch everybody next time.